Good evening. This month, Anthony Hopkins could win another Oscar for his portrayal of the eponymous Nixon in Oliver Stone's latest political epic. Hopkins gives a remarkable performance in a sweeping, untidy film that is by turn fascinating and irritating that begins at the time of Watergate and Nixon's downfall that traces the man's career in flashbacks and flashbacks within flashbacks and ultimately suffers by trying to tell us more than even a three-hour movie can encompass. Like JFK, this is very much Oliver Stone's slant on history, but here, unlike JFK, his speculation is less about what happened than why Nixon did what he did. Central to this, of course, is Anthony Hopkins, not necessarily the first actor you would choose to portray Richard Nixon. So when we met in Paris, where to portray Pablo Picasso, he had turned prematurely bald, we began by talking about the casting. Tony, the first, the most obvious question is, why did Oliver Stone choose you to play Nixon? It, it, it's, in a sense, it's a bit like getting Paul Newman to play Harold Macmillan. I mean, maybe a good choice, <laughs> but not an obvious one. You know, why? Uh, I've asked myself that question a lot since. He'd seen Remains of the Day and uh, Shadowlands and some of my work. He'd read a few interviews uh, of mine. Those rather boring interviews where they talk about my drinking years and my pain and all that. And I think he thought that I've been, I'd been through the mill a bit. And uh, he thought uh, the work in Remains of the Day was um, really good, playing repressed men, which I've been associated with and <clears throat> for some reason I, I don't know why he didn't think about the British accent and the the lack of Americanism in me or because I'm a, I'm a British actor and he said something about being Welsh and I don't know how much Oliver knows about Welsh people but he said there's something dark about me and um, uh, being the outsider whatever the combination was he wanted to cast me and I I, I played it I didn't play hard to get but I did questioned him. I said, you are aware, you know, I'm not an American and it's no easy task to get into an American rhythm of speech. Nevertheless, he said, well, he said, I think you can do it. And he said, I want you to do it. He said, it's up to you. He said, but uh, the part's yours if you want it. He said, I'm going to give you some time to think about it. And I thought, well, there's a chance to work with a really great, great director, a really great director of today's modern cinema. And I'd be a fool to turn it down. I'd regret it for the rest of my life. If I didn't, I may fall flat in my face. I've done the film. I may still get fall flat in my face. But I needed that challenge because I'd become a little complacent, very complacent, in fact. I was playing parts that were easy for me, like Remains of the Day, Shadowlands, that were dead easy parts. Is, is, is it true, as I've heard, that, that the final the clincher was that Stone said to you, if you don't play it, I'm going to offer it to Gary Oldman? <laughs> Ah, yes, it was. Well, he, uh, Oliver's a sort of demon, really. He said, um, he, said oh, he said, you can, he said, well, you've got a choice. You can go off and make those boring uh, films that you usually make, which no, nobody goes to see, meaning some, I don't know, Czechoslovak film, which I've done one or two of those. And he said, yeah, because I'm still undecided. He said, oh, yeah, he said, do you think Gary Oldman would be good? I said, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, because he has said that he, he detected a loneliness and a, and a melancholy in some of the parts you had played. Yes. Um, Presumably, that, is that part of you as well? I have no idea. Of course, you can never find out. I've, I've got a couple of friends who think I'm a little weird, a little uh, wild and a uh, little dark. Maybe I've got it. Maybe it's something to do with my Welsh nature. I do feel quite removed from life sometimes. I do feel a little um, dark area in my life. But I must say that it's been, it was a part of a lifetime that uh, opened me up. And uh, Stone is one of those extraordinary directors. He pushes you right to the edge of the precipice and uh, we did a scene with the scene with Kissinger when I pray uh, with Kissinger and he made me do it seven or eight times and uh, I gave all my all in each take and he said come on he can do even more and he but he doesn't he doesn't try to destroy you he just says more come on even more which is tremendous I and mean, it's a terrific uh, combination we had a great collaboration before I started the film, I went off for a week to, uh, to get a bit of rest in a health farm, uh, you know, one of those places. Took my script with me. I, I, I was already signed to do the part. And I sat there for hours and hours, uh, trying to get some rest, but trying to make sense of the part, the vocal aspect of the part. And there were many, many hours of desperation. I thought, I'll never do it. I'll never do it. And I must have been crazy to take this on. Went off to California, and we had a few weeks' rehearsal with a very good uh, voice technician, you know, a dialect coach. And gradually my confidence grew, 
And what happened was I remember on the first day uh, we had a reading with everyone else, all the American actors were there, James Woods, um, Paul uh, Sovino, and uh, everyone, E.G. Marshall, Larry Hagman. And I thought, well, I'm in the jungle now. I'm here with a bunch of American actors. How am I going to dare open my mouth? And uh, I remember starting it. Nobody seemed to titter, nobody passed out, nobody guffawed. I dared look up from a page once or twice, and Oliver Stone was there, and they were all concentrating. Nobody seemed to be laughing up their sleeve. We got through to the end of the script after about four hours of reading, and Oliver Stone said, great, okay, fine, nice, let's have a break. <clears throat> James Woods, who was a wicked man, came over to me and said, good German accent there. <laughs> He's a very self-effacing, very shy man, you know, terrific guy. We've become wonderful friends, and he was so... You know, like all actors, a little insecure about, you know, oh, I wonder if I'll be able to do the voice, and yeah, I don't know if I can get the mannerisms down, you know, and then, of course, the first day of shooting a walk on the set, I go, where's Tony? Well, Tony's gone. Richard Nixon's standing there, you know, somewhere on the set, and you look over and you go, my God, it's a tr it was a shocking transformation. Many things that are interesting about the film is, is that you don't actually impersonate Nixon, do you? You interpret him. Um, and the, the makeup was minimal, wasn't it? Yes, we, we tr uh, a wig, a hairpiece, the famous widow's peak, which is almost like a cartoon sketch. A uh, peak, a no ski lift nose, but the white teeth, uh, that toothy grin of his, brown contact lenses and some eyebrows, and that was it. But something that did help me was uh, I went to Washington with Oliver Stone and uh, a few others before we started the film. And. Uh, we went into the Oval Office, and I sat behind the desk and all that. We were having some photographs taken outside, just like a, a party outing. And uh, somebody took a photograph of me, and I did that, you know. And the moment I did that, I thought, that's him. That's the emblem of Nixon. I thought, that's the guy. And I thought, if I can gut that chest, you know, and then pull back that gesture and develop it from there, become a very physical actor, and that particular gesture, you know, the, um, the, uh, the and use, using the arms, using the closed gesture of Nixon, the hunched shoulders. And so that's what I did. I watched a lot of videotapes, a lot of interviews, every, the post-Watergate years as well, um, all the press conferences of Nixon um, from the early days. And I used to watch these just before going to sleep at night, so I'd, they'd register on the subconscious. Oh, that's what my game was. I, I, I think it works. And I remember the Friday afternoon before we started principal photography. It was um, April 28th, I remember. And uh, they called us in for a photo shoot into the Oval Office set at MGM, or now known as Sony. And we were dressed, and I had my makeup put on, and the hairpiece, and all that. And uh, I was a little late going in there because I, uh, they had to do some fiddling around with the hair. And I had the Nixon suit, and I walked down through the corridors, and it was a replica of the White House. And as I walked, as I approached the White House, I could feel my shoulders hunching. I thought, oh, there he is. <laughs> now, it sounds like I'm bragging, but I, that's my trade, that's what I do, and I guess the work had paid off. And as I walked in, Alex Butterfield, who had worked with Haldeman, was very close to Nixon, looked at me. Said, Oh my God, he said that's, well, it was, it was very flattering, but I needed that little ego boost, that bit of praise, and I said, you think it's, oh, he said, God, he said, it's really weird, he said, you are him. What advice did Oliver Stone give you about, about Nixon? Well, he, he, he was very concerned about us demonizing Nixon. He said, if you demonize the man, he, he did some appalling things, the bombing of Cambodia, the, I mean, atrocious, I mean, atrocities, war atrocities. Uh, then there was this flip side of him. It was as if there was a war between good and evil going on in the psyche of Richard Nixon. Um, and I've done a lot, of re a lot of research. Even when I think of it, I feel a compassion for the man. For whatever he did, I think he was a deeply troubled, uh, split personality, a, a, a deeply self-denied personality as well. He was uncomfortable on a one-to-one -one basis. He loved the masses. He loved going on the road. He was an actor, really. I mean, he was like... Uh, he loved the masses, he loved that, that's when he came to life. That was an aphrodisiac for him. But the masses didn't like him, did they? No, but he had something, he was charismatic. He was a real charismatic, and I think because he was a deeply disturbed neurotic. Elliot Richardson was the attorney general who resigned on the Saturday night massacre, said, I met him in Washington, he said the, the thing about Nixon was that he, uh, the defects of his character was so deep that 
that is what destroyed him. But without those defects, he would never have become president. And I think he did it by sheer force of will, a sheer rage. It's a surprisingly compassionate view of Nixon, isn't it? Because particularly coming from Oliver Stone, who is you know celebrated American liberal, he's almost a victim, Nixon, isn't he, in the film? Well, I think he was. Uh, well, he did. I, I, the fact is, one can, get, cannot get away from what he did. He inherited the war from Johnson. He inherited the Vietnam War. It became his war, having promised the electorate he would end it. There were so many complications about the ending of the war, he couldn't end it. The bombing of Cambodia was a desperate act of a madman, it seemed. Uh, his high crimes in office were unforgivable. He lied to the American people. People have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. I say this again, uh, as if I've become an authority on him. I haven't become an authority, but I watched him so closely, I thought, there's more to this man. There's a depth within him which is so lonely, so desperate. So I wanted to, apart from the fact there's, <coughs> there's, there's two daughters surviving today, and I didn't want to, that I took into consideration. I didn't want to offend them, but you know, I'm sure they won't like the film. But I. I, uh, we were all, I was very concerned that we didn't, uh, you know, trash him or, um, because he was a remarkable man. Whatever we say, he was, was a remarkable president. He could have been a great president. Inevitably, Nixon has attracted admirers and detractors in about equal measure. The Nixon family disapproved the Republican Party and Nixon lovers generally said the portrait of the hard-drinking, foul-mouthed, treacherous and devious president was too cruel. Nixon haters that it wasn't cruel enough. Historians, former presidential aides and the original Watergate journalists have taken issue with some of the facts. Well, Oliver Stone is well used to this kind of reaction to his work and indeed, I think he rather welcomes it. I'm very proud of the movie. I think uh, I think it works, uh, but I'm very close to it. So usually you need a couple of years to step away from these things, and then you look at the film again. I'm sure it has flaws, and I think it has uh, certainly. I know it has some strengths. So uh, we're in the body of my work. I guess it belongs in the in the JFK genre. In the sense, it's a bookend to JFK. JFK is a murder mystery. This is a character mystery. You know, there's a suggestion going around that the. The, the, the wording on the posters for Nixon should read, um, he was uh, a paranoid genius driven mad by ambition and power, and that's just for the director. <laughs> Would you go along with that? <laughs> oh, no, I don't know. Uh, he, he's a strange mixture, is Oliver Stone. Uh, they say, you know, uh, a lot of people in this staff say that um, it, it's the story of Nixon, of uh, Oliver's life. You know, he went in as a Nixon lover into Vietnam, came out as a staunch liberal. I don't know, he's a complex character. Um, he's driven. I'm talking about Oliver Stone now. He's, uh, I, I, not having worked with a director like him before, he's driven by um, a crazy passion. I, I don't know him that well. I mean, I've worked with him for 12 weeks. I still don't know him. He's a difficult man to get to know. Well, uh, yes, I, f I find that. And, uh, he seems to have had something of a humour bypass, I think, is, is, is one thing that one notes about yes. talking to Oliver. Well, there's inside of the American, which they don't get the English humour, I mean, British humour. They don't, they don't register that. Um, yes, I suppose he's a, he's a very dark character, a very dark character. Dark Two dark also. characters Two together. Two dark characters yeah. together. But that's where we got on so well, I guess. Maybe. It was the biggest surprise of my life because I'd heard that he was a monster and he turned out to be uh, one of the most, he's not benign, I mean, it's, it's like saying, trying to um, say that Genghis Khan's a nice guy when you get to know him. He's a big, big personality and he's a, a big ego, very powerful brain, very powerful mind. But we got on because uh, I, I needed all the help I could get, and uh, he appreciated that and uh, didn't abuse my trust at all. Uh, he was very surprised that I was there on time every day. Uh, I guess he's worked with people who don't show up on time or want to argue and fight. But work, you know, what's the point of fighting? I, I needed all the help I could get. I think that's what made us get on well together. I was amazed by his uh, flexibility, his ability to change uh, inflected performance. It was, for me, it was a treat to watch an actor of this caliber, and I, I consider him in almost a, a league of his own. Uh, and I've worked with some fine actors, and I think they, but he, Tony comes from a British uh, school that I have not been exposed to that much, where uh, it's truly looked upon as having total technical control over your body and, and your thought process and your facial expressions. It's using your own body as if you were your own marionette. Uh, it's an amazing experience to see that. It's American presidential year, of course. Um, oh, yeah. 
And the Republicans aren't going to much like this film. So you, you, you're, you're almost a weapon for the Democrats in the presidential election. Yes. Well, I don't know if it will, will the Republicans hate the film, because we are sympathetic to Nixon. Bob Dole and those people were very much... Well, they won't want to be reminded of all the things that he, Republican president, did. No, but they can't sweep them under the carpet, can they? I mean, uh, I mean, they're talking about the age of Nixon now. Uh, I don't know. I wonder if... I, I just wonder if there's going to be... Not because of this film, but if there is generally a reassessment of Nixon's career. What do you think he would have thought of the film? We probably hated it. But for those who write history as fiction on third-hand knowledge, I have nothing but utter contempt, and I will never forgive them. Never. He may have actually thought, wow, thanks for being so kind to me. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, I don't know if this is sheer fancifulness or madness or just tiredness during the film. But there were moments I actually, I felt he was there with me. I mean, that may sound terribly corny, but there were moments I thought, I, I think he's leaning over my shoulder somehow. I just felt a nudge from the man. The Oscar nominations. Now, you've been nominated, other nominations. Are you happy with all that? I mean, do you feel the film has been properly rewarded with nominations? Oh, yes, I do. I, I'm very happy. It's wonderful to be nominated. Uh, I think this is my, my third now. It's a wonderful feeling. It's a great honor, too. It's very exciting, the Oscars. I mean, everyone wants to win one. You know, you go there and smile when the other guy wins. You know, ah, of course you want to be up there yourself. And it's, uh, you'd be a liar and a fool to, say, to deny that. Um, uh, it's wonderful to win. And uh, it's wonderful to be nominated, but it's better to win. Uh, and I, I, I hope it picks up a lot of them. I think Oliver Stone really deserves uh, all the credit because they are now saying of him he's one of the great filmmakers of the decade or since Orson Welles or whatever. And um, he certainly is, in my estimation, one of the great ones. In the end, Nixon is a good but not very good film, an honourable but not entirely successful attempt to bring the life of a most remarkable man into sharp focus. Stone's direction, switching constantly from colour to black and white from now to then, has considerable virtuosity. But the film is at its best when it concentrates on Nixon's inner workings, on his ruthlessness, his surprisingly low self-esteem and need to be loved, and his constant debilitating awareness that but for the deaths of his own brothers and the Kennedy brothers, he might never have amounted to anything. It's here that Hopkins' performance is at its best. In America, the film has not done well, probably because there's nobody for the audience to identify with. Men wouldn't want to be Nixon, and women wouldn't want to go to bed with him. But for Hopkins, at least, it's been something of a triumph, the first of three very different films in which he'll be seen this year. Tony, you, your career seems to be getting better and better. Now, why is that? What have you done to make this happen? It's wonderful, because I've, I've had three or four goes on the merry-go-round. Um, I, I, I'm as baffled as anyone else is. I uh, sometimes I think if they got the right fellow, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, sure, I shouldn't be back in Port Albert. But I mean, this year alone, there's Nixon, um, August, the first film you directed, and and Picasso. Um, I mean, but, which which is not a bad trio for one actor in in one year. No, it's not bad. August, I'm interested in because that was your 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 first film as a director. Yes. Um, and you've got the bug now, haven't you? You want to do it again? Well, I had the bug then, and I did it. And then working with uh, Oliver Stone, I, I thought, well, maybe I should leave it to the big boys, the directors. I don't know if I... I'm not sure if I would want to direct again, because I'm not quite sure about that. The only problem with directing is once you've finished the film, you're not finished with it. You have to stay in the post-production, you have to stay with the editing, you have to be concerned about meetings, about s selling the film and all that. And I'm not really good at that. I, I am very restless. That's unfortunately why I've never been able to stay in the theatre for very long, because I, I'm very restless. At 58, I thought I'd be settling down into a nice kind of calm life uh, with a lot of peace of mind. I don't really want peace of mind. I just want to go on with this amazing adventure I'm on. <laughs> but I don't know if I can stay the course as a director. I, I think, you know, August is a good film. It's, I think it's OK. I, I'm very pleased with it. If August may be your one and only attempt at directing. I've got a feeling it may be, yes. Yeah. I, uh, yes. We, I'm a very fast director. I mean, they save a lot of money. I mean, 36 <laughs> setups in the first day. I mean, the producers were in heaven, you know. I, we were into the second day of the schedule in the first half of the morning. I mean, I really moved two takes, that's already allowed. And the actors, well, I said, now come on, you've done that, let's do it. So I did the music for it, which I, I was pleased with. Yes, that's a bit astonishing. I didn't, I didn't, well, where did this come from, suddenly writing music as well? Well, I used to write music as a little kid, drive my father crazy. My father was a baker, and I used to, um, 
played the piano all the time. I was a very introverted little boy. And I used to make up music, make up tunes. I used to play the same thing over and over, drive my father nuts. And I'm still driving, wherever he is now, now it's in full orchestra form. And George Fenton came to the house one day, he said, I can't write the music for you because I'm busy on something else, but I hear you write music. I said, well, he said, well, play the piano for me. So I did, and he said, well, that's beautiful. He said, uh, if you want me to orchestrate it for you, I will. So I worked with George Fenton for, who did Shadowlands and Gandhi, as you know, and I worked with George over in the studio for a few weeks on his synthesizers and computers, found all the orchestral pieces I wanted. And uh, he very kindly notated it for me and conducted it up at Wembley uh, over, over a week. And it was this, the most thrilling moment, I think, probably more than Nixon, to hear my orchestra music being, you know, being conducted by George on a uh, full-scale orchestra, 40-piece orchestra. I was very proud of that, and I think it's nice music. Everyone seems to like it. You, you were quoted a couple of years ago as saying that it wouldn't bother you if you never acted again. Was that, was that, did you actually say that? I think I was going through one of my phases. Ah, I go through phases. Well, the lonely melancholy phases. Yes, one of the things. I don't want to act anymore. I think people say, I think actors say that in order to get a bit of yeah. sympathy, so oh, you can't give a, think what we're losing. And I think somebody might have said to me, well, why not? Okay, fine. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't have liked that. I, I must say, I've, I have said, and I rather foolishly and irresponsibly sometimes, and I, I apologize for this moment, that I have said I don't want to work in the theatre again. But what I meant by that, and I qualify that, I, I'm, I'm re I am restless and I, I don't feel at ease in the theatre. I, 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 I'm a bit scared of it. And I remember doing Lear and Anthony and uh, Cleopatra. And I remember feeling uh, very dodgy about that. I'm not, I've never been comfortable in Shakespeare. And <clears throat> even doing Vaniel, August, in the theatre, the Theatre Cluid, for five weeks was a stretch of my, uh, my tolerance. After about Ten days, I think, oh, God, I, I, I can't do this every night. It's something in me. It's not the theatre. It's something in me that uh, I miss. And I've given it my best shot uh, over many years now, and um, I'm never really that happy. But you are in the cinema. I love the cinema because it's... Uh, I love it. I love the whole feeling of it, getting up in the morning, going to the dressing room, makeup. All. I love the routine. I love the excitement of it. I love the circus atmosphere hitting the road. At the end of the rap party, saying, bye, see ya, adios amigos, and get in the car and back into the night and on to my next... It's like life. It's like a life and a death. And there's something very impersonal about it. I think there's something so exciting about that. There's something about life in that. Life and death, you know, the long goodbyes, and it's over and done with it. Anyway, Tony, thank you very much indeed. I've enjoyed this immensely. It's been a pleasure. As usual, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.